Okay, let's go to our sermon time for today. We're going to close the year out with this, and hopefully it'll be helpful and instructive and a, a, a blessing to you in some way. The Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Colossians 4, verse 6. Paul tells us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. To edify means to improve someone spiritually or mentally, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Ephesians 4, 29. That's irrespective of the person being a believer or a non-believer. Each one should receive a certain measure of um, grace and decorum if you want to talk to them about spiritual things. And I've been calling the last two installments of this sermon peaceful protesters. We heard that term a lot this past year. Um, and by I mean peaceful protesters in the sense of Protestantism. The Baptist movement was never part of Protestantism. That is, real Baptists never broke away from Catholicism. They were always a separate line of believers through history. They lived uh, in different countries and were known by different names based upon who their, their visible leader happened to be at the time. But they were never part of Protestantism and then broke away from Catholicism in the Middle Ages. Uh, I'm always delighted when some unbelieving person, a friend at work, brings their spiritual or church type question to me, knowing that I can probably answer it for them. That's a real blessing. And uh, it tells me that maybe I'm doing something right at least to let them know there's somebody in the workplace you could trust with that question. And I'm always dismayed when a couple of my friends who are um, ostensible preachers bring their Bible questions to me because they're not deep students of the Bible and they don't know how to find the answers. That's rather disappointing. Uh, that's why you and I are told to study 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the only verse in the Bible that starts off telling you to study. And the King James Bible is the only Bible that tells you to study. All the others say, be diligent, um, do your best. That's very open-ended, very ambiguous. Your best might not be good enough. But Paul says what you and I are supposed to do. We're supposed to study. And he tells us uh, why we're supposed to study. To be approved before God and not to be ashamed. And then he tells us how we're supposed to study. By rightly dividing the word of truth. It can't be simpler than that. You break that verse apart, you find three parts that are absolutely crystal clear. But we're told to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. And uh, Paul tells us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and and to do of his good pleasure, Ephesians 2, verses 12 and 13. Now, you're not working for your salvation, and you're not fighting to get your salvation. You already have it. And his point is, now that you have it, do something with it. Don't let it fall by the wayside. Prove yourself worthy, if you can, of what God has deposited in you, what God wants to do with you as a child of God and the blessings of Jesus Christ. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith, studying uh, to be ready whenever battle 
comes to you. Now, we're using that, the Bible uses it as a metaphor. The Bible doesn't call you a spiritual or a, a, a Christian soldier in the literal sense, but you and I fight a fight uh, in the spiritual world, in the unseen world, for the souls of men. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. And our armament, the things we use to protect ourselves, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, um, their, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, those are all spiritual in, in nature. And Paul lists our weapons for us. Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 17, long in there. You, your one weapon is a spiritual sword called the Word of God. That's it. And unlike your unbelieving friends, unlike your Roman Catholic friends or family members, you don't depend upon a string of beads. You don't depend upon lighting candles or burning incense. You don't depend upon kneeling in front of a statue to pray and recite words you were taught in elementary school or catechism class. God gave you one thing, one physical object to hold in your hands and by which God can reveal himself to you and you learn about God. That's your Bible. That's your Bible. And these professing Christian churches who don't teach people how to read the Bible or to study the Bible and their church members don't show up to church bringing a Bible are worthless. They're wasting their time in the name of Jesus Christ. And they waste a lot of our time, too, telling us they're Christians and wanting us to join them in some, you know, cooperation. Um, why? I've got nothing in common with them. But uh, knowing the Bible better is the key. <clears throat> Let me say this clearly. Knowing the Bible better is the key to knowing God better. You're not going to get around it. You can't get around it. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. But so are the Scriptures. Both Christ and the Scriptures are each called the Word of God. And you can't know Christ clearly without spending time in that Bible. And you can't learn the Bible until you know Jesus Christ. They're inseparable. Didn't Christ say, unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required? Luke 12, 48. Yes, he did. And the context of that verse was a servant who failed to do what his master had given him instructions to do. He dragged his feet and wasted his time in service to God. James reminds us, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away, vanisheth away, James 4, 14. Paul says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, verse 16. Buy back the time, if you can, that you may have wasted years ago before you started living for Christ and knew Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, our instructions aren't to be picking fights with people or starting religious arguments with people in other churches or other places that disagree with us. Most of the world disagrees with you. You, you get a lot of people to fight if the truth be told. Um, but uh, we're called ambassadors for Christ uh, by Paul in um, 2 Corinthians 5.20. And the message we're supposed to preach is that men should be reconciled to God. They should be brought back into fellowship with the Lord God who loves them. Years ago, I was in a McDonald's restaurant by our house. There was a man um, who had just... We had just walked across the street from my work um, following a funeral service. 
And um, I invited this guy to come join me because he was waiting for a ride that took off without him. And uh, I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to lunch. You can come join me. We walked across the street. And almost immediately, we're in line or to order, and he's asking, what do you think of what the minister said a little bit ago? I said, how do you mean? He said, well, my mother was a Catholic. My father was a Presbyterian. And we didn't go to church very often. And uh, I don't know what I believe. What do you think? And I said, well, I guess I would call myself a Baptist. And, um, and I apologize. I don't have a copy of the Bible in my pocket with me. But I've read the Bible enough to know what God's book says. And that is, God's a holy God. He made you and I wanting to have fellowship with him. And uh, he, so Christ came into the world as a man to walk among men, to live among men. He can identify with men. But unlike men, unlike us, he committed no sin that ever needed to be forgiven. And so when he died, and the, when he died, his death was a substitute for us. His death was on our behalf. And so it's a very simple process. Um, you confess your need, <clears throat> you confess your guilt to God, and uh, ask his forgiveness for sin. And uh, his righteousness, the purity of Christ, is imputed to you, and your sin is put upon him, and a great transaction takes place between you, uh, the sinner, and the Savior. And I told him how I got saved when I was a little boy. And, you know, by this time, we were at our table, and we were eating lunch, and he said, you know, I'm, he had flown out here from Chicago, and he said, my, I'm 61 years old, my wife of 30 years just told me she wants a divorce, and uh, my life feels like a mess. I don't know what to do. And I said to him, Don, what you ought to do is you ought to make peace with God in your own heart. Talk to him about your own guilt as a sinner, that you know Christ died in your place on your behalf, and God wants to save you, forgive you, and uh, it didn't take very long, a few minutes, right over the Big Mac wrapper on the table there. He's bowing his head to receive Christ Amen. as his Savior. And uh, as I say, that was 1997. So um, over 40 years now, or tw 20 years now. And... Um, I wanted to call him so many times and just to see if he remembers our conversation. And I kept dragging my feet, dragging my feet. So finally, 20 years later, of course, you could find people on the Internet. I looked him up, called his home number, and he had just passed away a month before I called. I, I waited too long. But his wife answered the phone. I told her who I was. Reminded her of my conversation with her husband. And as it turns out, she said, oh, yeah, he, he mentioned that a couple of times over the years. And so it was real. And uh, she ended up not divorcing him. He began going to church with his wife. And their, their marriage got better and better. Because I had told him, listen, you get saved, and then you let God deal with the issues at home, and deal with your wife. And that's exactly what the Lord did, and I'm glad I said that to him. It turned out to be the right thing. And I thought, you know, 20 years later, you find out God did something real for someone. It was out of your control. It was just... Him trusting the Lord, and it, it turned out to be very beautiful. Dr. Ruckman talks about setting up his chalk talk board on a street corner in Alabama years and years ago. And it was a very empty corner, not much traffic at all. 
But he went through with it and preached an outdoor sermon on the street corner. And the only person he could see was a guy manning a gas station in the opposite corner when not much traffic going there. But he went through it, gave the plan of salvation, and closed in prayer. Years later, he's preaching, and a man comes up to him. And that man turned out to be the guy across the street who happened to be listening, listening, excuse me. And uh, he said, you led me to Christ years ago. Dr. Rugman couldn't figure out who and where. He says, I was across the street listening to you preach. So, um, it's been said, little is much if God is in it. And those are very true words. And uh, you can never... Um, you can never outdo God. You can never outgive God. But I'm so happy that in both of these, both of those cases, somebody was reconciled to God and their eternity changed. So I look forward to seeing this man one day at the rapture, see him in heaven. But we want to buy back the time that you may have wasted years before without Jesus Christ. Um, believers, unfortunately, are fast running out of time to do something for Jesus' honor and the glory of God. We're so uh, eager for the catching up of the saints, we're so anxious to hear the words come up hither and the rapture take place that we forget what we're supposed to do until that day, that day comes. If we're to uh, see men reconciled to God, Paul says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, uh, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 32 and 33. But as peaceful protesters, we want men to turn to Jesus Christ by the power of the Bible and the influence of the Holy Spirit on their hearts. I can't force somebody. You can't scare somebody or uh, shock them into salvation. You, then you'll be wondering if it was genuine to start with for the rest of your life. But this will be Peaceful Protesters Part 3 as we wrap this up today. Let me get moving here. We ended Part 2 by mentioning the vast wealth of the Roman Catholic institution worldwide. I want you to turn to one text as we get underway. That'll be 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and uh, notice verse 9. 1 Timothy 6 verse 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. We also read, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And God, excuse me, and the shipmen shipmaster, and all the company in ships and sailors, and many and as many as uh, trade by sea, stood afar off. Revelation 18, verses, verses 16 and 17. Now, if, uh, 
if you raise that verse of the Apostle Paul and someone says, wait a minute, are you trying to say that our church is uh, lustful and, uh, and uh, craving riches and seeking to get wealthier and wealthier? Are you trying to accuse our church of being that way? How do you answer that? Without being offensive, without starting a fight or an argument. You answer by saying that, and then you, now sometimes you have, let me say this, sometimes you have to use the jargon of the other person. You say, well, St. Paul the Apostle, you know, you use their language because everybody's a saint, this and that. St. Paul the Apostle is the one who wrote those words. And they have to apply to somebody. Now, if you don't accept those to apply to your own church, are you telling me that your church is not part of a Christianity? Christianity. You can't have it both ways. If that's written to the Apostle Paul as a warning to Christians, and you claim that your church is part of Christianity, that has to be a warning to you as well. Um, but the vast wealth of the Roman Catholic institution, the organization, Jack Schick would, would say, it's like a um, corporate headquarters in Rome, Italy, with a branch office in every neighborhood throughout the world. And I suppose that's a good analogy. Um, to, to very briefly summarize the church, the history of the Catholic Church. What began as the Roman Empire, the days of Christ, into the late 300s, maybe early 400s, began to fall apart, began to uh, unravel. But as that was happening, a new power, a religious power, began to grow. And soon the, the um, Caesars were morphed into the Roman Catholic popes. And the Roman Senate of advisors and territorial governors morphed into what we refer to as the College of Cardinals now. Um, the Vatican, or rather the imp Caesar's uh, palace sat on the same place where the Vatican sits today. And <clears throat> the Roman Empire began uh, to be called the Holy Roman Empire because it was now dominated by men with a religious emphasis. The land and the property of the Roman Empire didn't disappear. It wasn't divvied up against uh, 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 two individuals and members. It just got passed along to the next entity, the next group of popes and church officials. It then became known as the Papal States. Certain countries surrounding Italy and uh, abroad, the Pope was in charge of. Do you know the Vatican is the smallest actual country on earth? Just about 100, 108 acres inside the city of Rome, Italy. And it is the smallest actual nation, Guinness World Records. And the Pope, as the visible head of the Catholic Church, controls more wealth than any 10 rich billionaires combined in the world. It's, it's mind boggling how much wealth they possess and control in land holdings and business investments and property and schools and institutions and factories of various kinds. The Christian Brothers Winery, I believe is in Northern California, that's owned by the Catholic Church, so they make profit uh, tax exempt. And y you name it, it's, it's uh, hard to assess the total worth of the Roman Catholic institution worldwide. 
But the papal states then were eventually chipped away and it reduced, 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 so that now they have only the Vatican State since 1930. Uh, it was reduced to the Vatican State there in Italy. But the wealth didn't disappear. Who's going to give that up? And the wealth had just been growing for 1,500 years. It's, it would be humanly impossible to value the, the worth of the Roman Catholic institution and her holdings worldwide. One thing that has driven many people away from the Catholic Church is the Catholic religion's constant appeal for money and for donations. They say the Pope doesn't take a salary, but uh, his cassock, his white cassock is a $5,000 garment, and uh, Pope John Paul II was commonly uh, photographed with a $6,000 Rolex on his wrist underneath the cassock. And uh, why would you need a salary if everything in the world is at your disposal? But um, here are a few things, <clears throat> excuse me, here are a few things you'll find in the foyer, the entryway of uh, most Catholic churches. They don't have a track rack like we do, but they have envelopes. You can make donations to them uh, under different subjects. Here's one. Um, This is uh, simply a, a gift to help the retired priests and nuns of the Los Angeles Archdiocese. Here's an envelope that's always available when you go to the church. Uh, here's one, the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Very unspecific, but supposedly you give money to this fund and they'll make sure that Catholics uh, and Catholic children are educated in the religion as they ought to be. Uh, here's one to Catholic charities. That sounds very benign. What could be harmful about that? But there's nothing specif specified. Where is it going to go? Here's a supplemental um, envelope. If you forgot your regular tithing envelope, here's some extra envelopes. When you go to church, put your money in there. Here's a simple card reminding you you can give online Sign up for it, and your donations will be automatically withdrawn from your bank account. Uh, by the way, I've seen Baptist churches doing that. They have a little, like a kiosk inside their church lobby. You can sign on for online giving. The problem with that is the money is going to be taken out of your account regularly, even if you don't have to happen to have it that week. It should, be, it should be between the conscience of a man uh, and God. That's the way I, I think it ought to be carried out. Here's one simply to the diocese uh, for their development. Non-specific. Doesn't tell you what they're going to put the money towards. Just because they, they need it. They want you to help finance them. Here's one uh, called Together in mission. This is an annual campaign for the Los Angeles Archdiocese. Just give money to the church and uh, they will spend it as wisely as they know how to do. Here's one to the Father McIntyre Charity Fund every year. Um, and I'm not sure what the purpose of his donation is, but um, they simply want you to give uh, so that his group can put it towards charitable work. Here's another one. National needs. National needs combined collection. Also unspecified. Doesn't tell you what the money is intended for, who's getting it, where it's going, uh, and so forth. But uh, they simply ask you to give. And here's one. That carries, that's carried out almost annually, almost rather all year long, called Peter's Pence. They consider the 
Pope to be the successor of Simon Peter, and Peter's pence is simply a donation to the Pope, just because. And these envelopes are available in Catholic churches year long. Well, if there is a 1.3, 1.4 billion members of the Catholic Church, and let's suppose they get a billion dollars, one billion dollars every every two weeks or once a month, representing all their members. By the end of the year, the Pope's got a pretty good chunk of money to spend and uh, do with whatever he wants to do. Uh, and, but you're asked to give. You're asked to do it because the church needs it, the Pope needs it, and he knows how to spend your money better than you do. Um, so I know which party he belongs to in, the, in American politics. But last time I mentioned a few things that uh, the church has displayed and done over the centuries, um, such as a feather supposedly fallen from the angel Gabriel's wings, a lock of hair that came from uh, Mary's head. Certain churches claimed to have that on display. Um, the Shroud of Turin. And I mentioned back in the 1300s, the bishop at the time uh, declared it to be a fake. And they dated it back to that time in history. Turns out it probably was and is a fake. But each one of those things and all others that we listed uh, came with a price. If you wanted to see it, pay the priest, pay the bishop, and uh, they would let you see it. A few years ago, when Pope Benedict XVI was still Pope, they paraded a handful of bones, and they were very careful in reporting it that it is believed to be the, pope, the bones of Simon Peter found uh, in the base or in the uh, Vatican. See, they can never be specific. They can't say definitely that this has been proven or tested or shown to be anything. They let people believe what they want to believe as long as they'll remain loyal to the church and uh, obedient to their priest and their parish and their bishop and not question what's taught, not question what's presented, not question what's said and recited during their prayers. We mentioned the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II, I should say, uh, speaking numerous times during his pontificate and saying in front of the crowd, actually praying to the virgin goddess, saying, we implore you, we consecrate ourselves to you, we worship you. As So I began two, two weeks ago saying the Roman Catholic religion does not worship the Lord God of the Holy Bible. They worship a virgin goddess who is paraded around um, for centuries, she's appeared long before Christ in other nations, under other names, a virgin goddess with a, a baby in her hand, or a baby in her arms, just as Mary is portrayed with the baby Christ. Just change the names over the centuries from nation to nation, culture to culture, and uh, think it'll be completely different. Near the end of the first thousand years of the church age, there were Catholic leaders in Europe who conflated the thousand years of the previous history with the 1,000 year reign of Christ, Revelation 20, and they tried to uh, confuse them with each other and taught people that the year 1,000 is coming Christ is going to return, and if he catches you, finds you, hoarding lands and livestock and farms, property, it'll look selfish on your part. However, if you were to donate that to the church, to Christ's kingdom, it would look wonderful on your part, and you could avoid his wrath and judgment. 
So people were donating their lands and their property to the Roman Catholic authorities. And when the year 1000 came and went and Christ hadn't returned, farmers found they couldn't get their land back. They couldn't get their property back. These were now the, the uh, possession of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. So they have all kinds of sneaky ways to gain wealth. One of the things that Martin Luther was extremely upset about was the selling of indulgences. Asking people to donate so much money to buy their deceased loved one out of purgatory. For such and such price, uh, give this to the church and uh, the priest will say a mass or a prayer on their behalf and uh, it'll hasten their their uh, exit out of purgatory. I was talking with a couple of our church members before we got started that if your parents die and you were all Roman Catholic and you're a dutiful, obedient Catholic, you pay so much money to the priest to say a mass, to part perform mass on their behalf, in their memory, but uh, no one knows when they are released from purgatory. And then when you die, your children are expected to pay for you and also for your parents. So you can all get out of purgatory eventually. And the banks call this the magic of compound interest. Your interest builds on the interest of someone else. So the vast wealth of the Catholic Church has always found a way to grow, and uh, it's very, very unlikely, or rather it's, it's very difficult to see it shrink in any measurable way. When the pedophile scandal, the child abuse scandals were erupting worldwide about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, most of the archdiocese in the United States had scandals, if not all of them. Um, the one that was the biggest and the most costly was right here in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Archdiocese. I think the Archdiocese of Boston ended up having to pay over $80 billion to settle lawsuits with former victims of priests for the past previous 30 years. But here in Los Angeles, the Archdiocese of, of LA Cardinal Roger Mahoney at that time, had to pay $600 million settling lawsuits by former victims of Catholic priests, molestation victims, and so forth, going back 35, 40 years. And the United States diocese uh, um, have spent over $2 billion collectively settling lawsuits by people who had been hurt and abused by priests as they were growing up as children. Let me say, any church that is able to afford $600 million and keep on operating is a church whose wealth you can't even think of. You can't imagine. That's like I say, it's probably impossible for any of us to assess the total worth of the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. And the wealth just kept growing. It was passed along to the next generation of popes and church leaders. And her wealth has been growing consistently since then. Avro Manhattan, who was a war correspondent during World War II. He's passed away now. But his specialty, his expertise, was Vatican politics. He wrote a book called uh, The Washington Moscow, or The Vatican Washington Moscow Alliance, and how the Vatican was playing both sides, the Soviet Union, the United States, who shall we side with uh, to benefit us in world politics. And he wrote another book called The Vatican Billions about her vast wealth and how she accumulated it. 
And he writes about one pope who was so fascinated with gemstones. Popes, are, popes were given triple tiaras, triple crowns um, to wear on their head, some weighing as much as uh, 13 to 15 pounds, all encrusted with gemstones and gold and silver, signifying the pope's authority over heaven and hell and the earth. And uh, he's the supreme. To, by the way, the term Pontifex Maximus was the title of the Caesars. And that is now the title of popes, Supreme Pontiff. So they even borrowed the names that the Caesars would use. But uh, one, he talks about one pope was so fascinated and fixated with gemstones and precious stones that uh, he would lay in bed surrounded by gemstones and lay on top of, of uh, rubies and stones uh, on the blankets where he'd slept and uh, wore his crown so long and it was got too heavy for him that eventually he had an apoplectic fit, his neck snapped, and he died from wearing the crown too long. And with that much money, or with access to that much wealth and the authority to command people to do what you want them to do, to believe what you want them to believe, the temptation to sin is very, very great. Who could resist that environment? But Michael Ryan is a very dedicated Roman Catholic, and he's retired as a U.S. Postal Inspector. <clears throat> and for 20 years, he's been trying to contact the Catholic bishops and a few cardinals here in the United States to propose a plan to them to reduce theft and uh, embezzlement out of the collection plates at Catholic churches. Uh, embezzle is another form of theft. It's just something you do little by little over a period of time so that no one notices. And uh, for 20 years, he's been avoided and ignored by the Catholic bishops in the U.S. Let me give you a few examples that he cites as the reason that this is necessary. Now, he's assuming most theft uh, it comes at the hands of church members as the basket's being passed. In Buffalo Grove, Illinois. 2005, for over five years, a business manager at a Catholic church parish, excuse me, stole over $600,000 from collections to support his own gambling habit. Cost the church close to $2 million before the whole thing was settled. Another case, Chicago, Illinois, 2005. A former uh, priest of a Southwest Side Catholic Church was sentenced to four years in prison after pleading guilty to laundering more than $1 million from the collection plates, skimming an average of $2,500 to $3,000 per week. Santa Rosa, California, 1997. A Catholic bishop, whose name is withheld, publicly vowed to deal with priestly misconduct. Uh, yet, at the same time, he secretly kept quiet about a priest who had confessed to, um, uh, excuse me, had admitted stealing from a church and had been accused of molesting four young men. He simply moved the priest from one church to another church, stay one step ahead of the scandals. Another case, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1999. 
a church secretary, helped steal $25,000 from the collection plates of her parish church um, outside Pittsburgh. She helped uh, Walter Benz embezzle a total of $2 million over a 25-year period, also taking uh, $2,500 to, to $3,000, or rather $1,000 to $5,000 out of the collection plates per week. Um, she spent uh, years helping him steal, to go on gambling vacations, to help him spend the money buying uh, antique firearms, expensive cars, and uh, doubled as his girlfriend. He was the parish priest for 25 years, Father Walter Benz. Let me begin to, to wind this down. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after, which while well, some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy 6:10. King Solomon said, Labor not to be rich, Proverbs 13, or Proverbs 23, verse 4. And that was his great sin, the accumulation of wealth, thinking he could get away with it when he knew better. You ever consider what Solomon Solomon wrestled in his conscience? He had uh, over a thousand wives, seven hundred wives, three hundred concubines, which were essentially secondary wives. They were at his disposal whenever he wanted. And then you read the the uh, Song of Solomon, and he talks about his one love, one beloved wife whose worth and value to him was worth all the others combined. It took him a thousand women and pride to realize one that truly loves me and I'm in love with her uh, far outweigh whatever the others were worth. But pride uh, causes men to do things they think they can get away with and shouldn't do. Over the last few weeks, we've gone from the strange, that is, flying houses and uh, images on people's ponchos, the, the bird poop Mary, uh, the images of Mary on a water stain or a coffee stain, to the, the uh, shameful, that is, the idea of accumulating wealth and taking it and not caring how you got it or who it actually belonged to. Um, and we're going to finish today looking at the scandalous, the scandalous. When Martin Luther went to Rome as a priest in 1517, He said to the city, Holy Rome, I salute thee. To him, this was the eternal city of God. And he had walked there on foot all the way. But once he was there, he began to witness Catholic priests conducting their mass while publicly drunk. He learned about popes who had raped women, fathered illegitimate children, and heard of them selling indulgences, give us so much money, and your loved one will be released out of purgatory. And he couldn't believe that they were doing it, because this was totally different than the way he lived as a monk back in Germany. And uh, he later would say, if there is a hell, surely Rome is built over the entrance to it. That was his eventual assessment of his own church. Now, in the year 897, Pope Stephen VI called for a trial of a previous pope 
whose name was Formosus, he died nine months before the next pope, Stephen, called for a trial. He wanted to try the previous pope as being a heretic, teaching witchcraft and other heresies. So what they did, they exhumed the dead body of the previous pope, propped it up in a chair, and began to level charges against him and uh, accuse him of various crimes against the church. And uh, of course, they had someone answering on behalf of the, of the accused, and they found him guilty, and they cut the head off the body, ended up throwing the body into the Tiber River there in Rome. This is how they deal with people they didn't agree with. Pope Celestine the fifth had resigned as pope and uh, rather and chose rather to go live in solitude in a cave as a monk or a hermit and this went on for a few years and a time came when they the cardinals needed to vote to choose a new pope and they were divided as to who they would choose and prefer so one side, the leader, the candidate, he shows up with a fancy parchment and uh, uh, unreadable writing on it and claims that this was a divine document uh, designating him to be chosen as the new pope. Well, the popes disagreed, and so they decided, let's go out to the monk and ask for his opinion. So they all went out to the cave where the previous pope was living and he looked at it, and they presented their challenge to him, and he said, yes, this is indeed a divine document. But I can tell you the interpretation is that I should be made the pope once again. So they agreed. They escorted him back to Rome, made him the pope. But uh, he had not been spending much time bathing while he was outdoors, and his hygiene was lacking. And uh, in the Vatican, he would sit for hours on the papal throne, uh, sometimes soiling himself, and then sitting in it for hours. And he literally stank at the Vatican. And he became an embarrassment to the cardinals when other you know, dignitaries from countries would come. He was an embarrassment. And his nickname is the Smelly Pope the smelly pope. And I'm going to close right there, but the Apostle Paul wrote, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may, excuse me, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, at his will, 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. Who oppose themselves, Paul says. Some people become their own worst enemy. They hear the gospel and they think, that's for other people, but not for me. Well, that's a stupid response. If all have sinned, all need to be forgiven. And uh, if all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then why would you say no to the only solution to save your soul and grant you eternal life. And that is trusting the power of the blood of Christ and the grace of God to forgive you. I'm so glad that I asked God to save me and forgive me as a little boy. That was the most fantastic experience of my early childhood. And I haven't forgotten it, and I trust the Lord that I never will forget it. And uh, if it's not real for you that way, then get on your knees and thank God for the salvation that you do have and to help him to bring details of it to your memory and make it more of a blessing to you with every passing day. All right, let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, a day that we can consider these things as we close out a year. We ask you to be our guide and teacher. Instruct us by these things. Um, help us to be better educated in these matters, understand our job isn't to start fights, but our job is to be uh, ambassadors for Christ and represent the Lord Jesus Christ without provoking people to become our enemies. 
Sometimes the truth will make someone upset uh, without our involvement, without our help. We ask God that you'd lead and direct our thinking in the days ahead, and uh, we'll ask it now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.